But what is the left now? I'm a critic of the left, and yet there is no place for me to participate in Western politics except on the left. Today, if you want to ask a simple question, a simple but fundamental question like, what is the future of higher education in the United States, in Canada? Who cares about having lower tuition? Who cares about helping the poor access higher education? The people who are asking those questions and trying to come up with new answers are entirely on the left, and indeed, many of them are socialist. There's nothing socialist about the question. There's nothing socialist about the answer. But we don't have a lively free market competition of ideas where the center and the liberals and the conservatives are all coming up with different answers to this. Such a fundamental and obvious question is considered a left-wing fringe ideal. It shouldn't have anything to do with socialism. It's not a socialist problem. For my immediate future, I don't see any reason why I should struggle to try to create an alternative solution to that problem in the center or in the right or trying to get into bed with the conservatives but they don't even want to hear it, as opposed to hanging around the door somewhat uncomfortably to the left and saying, hey guys, at least you're asking these questions. At least on a fundamental level, you care. I care too. Can we work together to make something positive happen? Is it better to have our telephones provided to us through free market competition or through a government monopoly? Is it better to have our train service offer, operated by 10 companies competing in free market competition or a government monopoly? Those are very real questions. But this brings us back, first things last, to the question of what is socialism? The meaning of socialism, which I've found trampled on and misrepresented in so many of these videos, and I made a survey with the different people attempting to define the term, <laughs> the meaning of socialism is simply the consolidation of control in government hands. It's taking away the element of investment and the element of risk from the private sector and putting it in the hands of the state. Yes, on a propaganda level, people can refer to that as ownership by the people or the operation of a business or a service for the people. But the reality is you're talking about ownership by the state and ultimately for the state. If that is a perfectly transparent and perfectly democratic state, then yes, it will serve democratic interests. And if it is anything less than that, it will serve the government's interests. Da -da 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 -da. Hey guys, this video is going up on my new YouTube channel, and uh, it's going to be promoted under hashtag politics and pajamas. Nobody else was using the hashtag politics and pajamas. Can't tell you why. Um, and it looks like marking this transition to a new era in my YouTube broadcasting experience. I said experience, not career. Um, I'm going to have to get a new microphone because take one of this video was ruined by the microphone dying on us about halfway through. Look, guys, this is a sincerely made video, and I'm going to disclose my bias here at the beginning, the middle, and the end. I am not a socialist. I do not describe myself as a socialist. But it seems to me a great shame that the meaning of the word is misrepresented by its supporters, its detractors, its critics. And it's so widely misunderstood now that it seems to be impossible for anyone to take a reasonable position on the matter. I mentioned Cicero in the title of this video because I've recently been reading the political philosophy of Cicero. He's a famous author from ancient Rome, and he's like one of the last major authors in that era that I'm reading. I'm very well read in the ancient Greeks, in English translation, <laughs> needless to say. I don't read Greek or Latin myself. Um, but for many years, it was on my mind that one of the gaps in my own education I had to fill in was reading Cicero. And one of the single most influential ideas that Cicero set down for the next thousand years was the idea that the best form of government was not any one ideal, but a hybrid of several competing ideals. And the competing ideals he dealt with in his own time were democracy, monarchy, and aristocracy. Now, when I read about this as a young man, I completely rejected this approach. I felt about this the same way that some anarcho-capitalists feel about socialism and the way that I think most socialists feel about capitalism. I responded to this approach of Cicero's by saying, in effect, if you think slavery is bad, 
you don't seek to have a political establishment that incorporates slavery, no matter how harmoniously. You don't try to have a society that retains the best aspects of slavery or a moderate amount of slavery. You want to get rid of slavery entirely if you believe slavery is evil. Um, if you've come to the conclusion that aristocracy is fundamentally an immoral and evil and counterproductive form of government, you don't want to have a society that incorporates a balanced quantity, a reasonable you know, measure of aristocracy. You want to get rid of aristocracy entirely. And this is a debate that still goes on in countries including United Kingdom, England, even uh, Australia. What is the role of aristocracy and what is the role of monarchy in these, in these countries today? Is it something they should rid themselves of entirely? Why are they keeping around some, some vestiges of it? But anyway, obviously, thousands of years ago, even just 1,000 years ago, this was, this was a much more hotly debated topic. Um, it's very easy for capitalists, pro-capitalists, to come to this conclusion, which is rarely sincere, that socialism is inherently evil, and then they argue it shouldn't be a part of our society at all. Well, what does socialism really mean? A guy named Milton Friedman would provoke both his allies and his enemies by pointing out that within the United States of America, the army, the United States military, was a socialist economy within a capitalist economy. It operated on socialist principles, evaluated as an economy within a capitalist economy. So if you think you can do without socialism entirely, as a pro-capitalist, do you think you can do without the army? Now, there are numerous other examples. I don't know of a single country anywhere in the world that truly has privatized sewage treatment. Do you really think you can do without sewage treatment? It, whether To what extent it's possible to have a purely private sector uh, electrical grid, um, you know, provision of healthcare services, so on and so forth. When you look sector by sector throughout the economy, um, most of the Western European countries today are a hybrid of socialist and capitalist elements. And they've generally come to a kind of piecemeal solution as to which elements of the economy can be privatized, if they were socialist in the past, which elements of the economy must be run by some kind of government bureaucracy because they just don't work when they're left up for the free market to decide. So I point this out all the time in conversations. You know, when I grew up in Canada, we are going through a period of transition. The uh, telephone infrastructure very much began as a government monopoly on socialist principles, you might say. And believe me, I'll come back to how do we properly define socialism. We shouldn't leave this too vague for too long. Um, and then there was the question of, well, can we transition from having just one taxpayer-funded provider of uh, telephone services to having multiple companies competing? Having multiple people come to your door with a leaflet and say, hey, we hope you'll sign up with our telephone company instead of this other telephone company competing to provide you with better prices. Now, the underlying reality was, at that time in Canada, all of the infrastructure was built by the taxpayer anyway. They were using the taxpayer-created, monopoly-created, you know, the actual telephone poles and wires and what have you, and creating a bit of an illusion of free market competition on top of it. Does anyone really believe that the free market can work in providing and operating prisons? Does anyone believe that the free market can come to your door with a pamphlet and say, hey, we hope you'll sign up for our sewage system? Don't sign up for our competition. Don't sign up with that company. Don't sign up for the Coca-Cola sewage system. Sign up for the Pepsi sewage system. And we'll just like hitch up your toilet to a different set of pipes to whisk away your poo to be treated at our sewage treatment center before it goes into the river. There are some sectors of the economy that you know, are, are incorrigibly socialist in character. And this is why we, we can't have this attitude. We, we can't have the attitude... I did research for doing this video. Believe me, I already know the meaning of socialism. That, that's not what I was researching. I did research into how the meaning of socialism is being misrepresented today by both its proponents and its detractors. And it's disturbing for me to see the extent to which today um, there are millions of people who feel that the meaning of the word socialism is something so sacrosanct that it can't be questioned that anyone who considers themselves a good person must use this word positively and unthinkingly and unquestioningly without inquiring into it. And on the other hand, there are millions of people who think that this is uh, an inherent and self-evident evil. 
and cannot be questioned, and they also don't seem to really understand what socialism is, or the fact that each and every actually existing capitalist economy in the world is in fact a balance of socialist and capitalist elements. In fact, what we've come back to in some ways, um, in this sense, um, you know, is reminiscent of Cicero's philosophy of the hybrid polity, of the, these different competing elements being incorporated into one state. It's not what Cicero had in mind, but uh, that was his view of how to balance democracy by having a democracy held in check by aristocratic and, and monarchic elements. And we certainly have a socialist economy held in check by free market elements and vice versa, um, uh, you know, a capitalist economy held in check by free market elements. I'm sorry, I said the same thing. Editor, no edits, no take two. Let's keep rolling here. All right. <laughs> Um, what is socialism and why is it so broadly misunderstood? <sighs> it's been drawn to my attention back when I was a scholar of Buddhism that I am what's called an originist. I like to explain concepts by going back to their origins, their first usage. So you can imagine the history of Buddhist philosophy, this myth that I was interested in looking at in their original cultural context, their original literary usage, what were the meanings of the words involved, etc. And I think it can be done productively when you're looking at ancient Greek and Latin philosophy, even when you're looking at 19th century German philosophy, I was pointing out to someone the other day in a particular text, um, you know, the meaning of the word liberal just a couple centuries ago was much different than it is today. You had to read the text in a certain way, knowing that key political terms have changed their meanings. The meanings of words can change over centuries. They can change sometimes over decades. I think socialism is an example of that too. I think when Bernie Sanders uses the word socialism, or when people say that Bernie Sanders is a socialist, we really have to question what the meaning of the word socialism is now and in that context and in what sense Bernie Sanders is a socialist. Um, in what sense was Bill Clinton a socialist? In what sense was Tony Blair a socialist? In many ways, the current generation with Bernie Sanders really taking over the leadership of the left is, from my perspective, much, much more hopeful than uh, those those prior decades. when. Um, but the origins of socialism... And to really understand why the word has its moral significance, both for socialists who love it and for, I don't know, anarcho-capitalists who hate it, you have to dial your mind back to approximately the year 1850. In the year 1850, the Western world was in a period of dramatic transformation. It was going from being an agrarian, agricultural-based society to being an urban, industrialized society at a remarkable rate. From country to country, whether you're looking at England, United States, Canada, these countries went from being 80% uh, rural, 80%, 90% people being employed in agriculture, to being predominantly uh, people employed in cities, not entirely in uh, industrial manufacturing, but with factories being one of these you know, rising, very visible signs of the Industrial Revolution, modernization, new technology, etc. New forms of production, new forms of consumption, new forms of employment, and um, traditional society in many ways disappearing and being relegated to a very marginal status. Um, the functions of government as we see them today, both in terms of social services and under all other categories, they really did not exist in 1650. Not at all. Um, even the example of the military being a socialist economy. In the year 1650, that's not the, the military in that sense didn't exist at all. You had aristocrats who employed men at arms, who trained and raised men to be ready for military service. The creation of a centralized, taxpayer-funded bureaucracy, that's in the centuries following thereafter a permanent standing professional army, etc. And the way wars were organized and the way governments had to appeal to their taxpayers, namely aristocrats, very different game in 1650. 1650, 1750, 1850. Around the year 1850, this is really a transformation of society in ways, some ways that are obvious, like people leaving the countryside and moving to the cities, people no longer being employed in agriculture, being employed in industry, obviously the emergence of new technologies, etc., uh, etc., et cetera. But in a more subtle and pervasive way, the expectations of the government, expectations of whether it be democracy or, or, or otherwise, the expectations of what services should be provided ultimately by 
taxpayer-funded bureaucrats. This was changing profoundly with no manifesto to declare it, with no clear single movement clamoring for it. In the aftermath of World War I, for example, um, you had starvation, rubble, and devastation, but you didn't have highly professional international charity organizations, such as United Nations organizations, or such as donation-driven civil society organizations, but that imitate those UN organizations or government organizations. You didn't have, um, in effect, the, the government monopolization of charity, which goes on under socialism and to a varying extent in, in modern Western liberal democracies. You didn't have uh, bureaucrats coming out to feed and clothe the poor. This late as World War I, to a remarkable extent in the World War I period, still, um, the work of charity was in the hands of the church. But if you think about that period of time, from 1850 to 1918, that was exactly the period in which the potential for the government to take on those responsibilities of caring for the poor, the unemployed, for the government to expand and take over responsibilities that previously had fallen at the feet of aristocrats and the church. Um, this profoundly influenced the way that members of democratic societies perceive their governments and in which they perceive themselves. The government, of course, always had advantages. The government has the ability to go into debt to an astounding extent, not an unlimited extent. They can raise millions of dollars going to debt. They can spend taxpayers' money. They can provide a certain kind of detached egalitarian service that the church inexorably and inevitably doesn't provide. So in the aftermath of World War I, the charities that existed at that time, do you think that they uh, served Jews, Christians, and Muslims equally? They did not. It's a very real historical fact. And the struggles with this and of wanting instead to have a... Um, an impartial and detached bureaucracy administering to people's needs in these times. Uh, this was itself, you know, a cause for great uh, optimism about the expansion of, of socialism. If you could say the expansion of the socialist economy, replacing what had heretofore been aristocratic and religious elements of our of our civil society. Yo, what's up? Welcome to my second installment of my ideology. Ide ideological review series today we're doing all right hold on you got communism although the meanings of words have changed in ways both subtle and coarse. Uh, one thing that's remarkably consistent from 1850 to 1918 and from 1918 to 2018 today, one thing that's remarkably consistent is that advocates of socialism will always describe the function of socialism as taking over private ownership for the people. They will describe businesses and social services as being owned by the people, administered by the people. But the sad fact is, what they mean is, these institutions are administered by the state. They're administered by the government. But as I've already explained, if you were alive in that period of time, 1850 and for at least 50 years after that, it would have been very easy to be optimistic about uh, whole businesses, um, power plants, uh, telephone services, all these new and wondrous things that were coming with the advancement of the industrialized society, it would have been very uh, you know, easy to be optimistic even about the government taking over soup kitchens, giving out food to the poor, because look at who they were taking over from. They weren't really taking over from a vibrant capitalist society where Coke and Pepsi were competing over who was going to clean your water after you pooed in it and you dump it into a river with a sewage treatment plant. It's not reality. It was the possibility of having a professional bureau bureaucracy take over functions that, as I've said a million times, heretofore, were dominated by the church. 
and were dominated in a way that was obviously, you know, prejudicial and disadvantageous to many. In a sense, nobody in our modern society could ever be uh, satisfied with those vestiges of an earlier feudal era being of such importance. So almost anything seemed better than that. And it's really a separate question when today we look at it um, without that historical context and we just ask in an open-minded way, is it better to have our telephones provided to us through free market competition or through a government monopoly? Is it better to have our train service oper operated by 10 companies competing in free market competition or a government monopoly? Those are very real questions. But this brings us back, first things last, to the question of what is socialism? The meaning of socialism, which I've found trampled on and misrepresented in so many of these videos, and I made a survey, the different people attempting to define the term, <laughs> the meaning of socialism is simply the consolidation of control in government hands. It's taking away the element of investment and the element of risk from the private sector and putting it in the hands of the state. Yes, on a propaganda level, people can refer to that as ownership by the people or the operation of a business or a service for the people. But the reality is you're talking about ownership by the state and ultimately for the state. If that is a perfectly transparent and perfectly democratic state, then yes, it will serve democratic interests. And if it is anything less than that, it will serve the government's interests, just as ineluctably and inexorably as a charity operated by the Catholic Church is not only going to serve the needs of the poor or the alcoholics they're helping, it's going to serve the interests of the church because that is its owner. That's its chain of command. First of all, well, so I got to go back. Communism, it's the idea made by Karl Marx in his Communist Man Manifesto. And he said, well, what we should do is we should... Oh, we shouldn't have government or business owners. Workers should own the means of production who, instead of making goods for money, they make it for the good of the people. And then everybody's happy. There's no money because you can't buy anything. There's no greed. It's just great. But does it hold up in real life? So I closed this video by commenting, and not for the first time on this channel, that I'm a critic of the left, and yet... There is no place for me to participate in Western politics except on the left. It's really disturbing to consider that today, if you want to ask a simple question, a simple but fundamental question like, what is the future of higher education in the United States, in Canada? Who cares about having lower tuition? Who cares about helping the poor access higher education? The people who are asking those questions and trying to come up with new answers are entirely on the left, and indeed, many of them are socialist. There's nothing socialist about the question. There's nothing socialist about the answer. But we don't have a lively free market competition of ideas where the center and the liberals and the conservatives are all coming up with different answers to this. Such a fundamental and obvious question is considered a left-wing fringe Ideal? I mean, so Bernie Sanders apparently has a, a monopoly on the stunningly obvious issue that tuition in the United States of America is much too high. Even when you just compare it to other real world examples like Germany, Sweden, what have you. Um, you don't have to compare them to the ideal. You can compare them to something all too real, right? So tremendous fundamental question in our society. Who's asking the question? Who's coming up with new answers? It shouldn't have anything to do with socialism. It's not a socialist problem. And yet right now, the socialists have a monopoly on it. And that's tremendously sad. I hope that'll change. For my immediate future, I don't see any reason why I should struggle to try to create an alternative solution to that problem in the center or in the right or trying to get into bed with the conservatives when they don't even want to hear it, as opposed to hanging around the door somewhat uncomfortably to the left and saying, hey guys, at least you're asking these questions. At least on a fundamental level, you care. I care too. Can we work together to make something positive happen? I could say the same thing again about fundamental questions of ecology. Do you want to pretend that the conservatives of the Republican Party are coming up with visionary new plans to take on the ecological problems of our day? They're not. 
I could try to be in the ecological wing of the Republican Party or the Conservative Party. Nothing's going to happen. It's unfortunate because, as I say, on the one hand, some people just perceive socialism as an evil that they don't want to compromise with. And this is a fundamentally inane misperception of reality. As I've said before, Milton Friedman himself recognized that the American military is a socialist economy within a free market economy. It's a socialist bubble or a socialist sphere, if you like. So if you want to have a society that's completely rid of socialism, you'd have to be rid of the military. This is an odd one because communism in the base of Karl Marx's thingy, his communist manifesto says there shouldn't be government. But that is... Well, you could say he's stupid because economically, without a government and without business owners, you're not going to end off too well. Because what you have is you have workers that are expected to work without pay. And they have to give it to other people. So they're basically slaves to everybody. Which doesn't go down too well. So people are like, hey, since, I'm not, since I don't have to work, I'm just going to not work and let everyone else be my slave. So then that's not good. So what do you do? Obvious. You get government to intervene and, you know, force people to work. So now, his first flaw, there has to be a government, has to be authoritarian forcing people to work. So, uh, Karl Marx did not think this over too well. Conversely, of course, it's become absurd for socialists to claim that they want to live in an entirely socialist economy, we should say a command economy, such as existed with disastrous effects resulting in the starvation to death of millions of people in China, Russia, etc. The uh, real-world examples we have to draw from, learn from, and build on are all, at this point, hybrid economies. They are in part capitalist, in part socialist, and they've come about through a sort of... Um, series of ad hoc decisions as to what the market can and cannot solve for us and what questions have to ultimately be answered um, through government intervention or through setting up socialist economies within a capitalist context. I made this video in part because I heard a discussion amongst vegans on uh, Discord and they were really discussing the fundamental questions of economics. I consider textbook questions of economics about where the free market starts and stops what are the limitations of capitalism? At what point must we necessarily be talking about socialist elements in a free market system and vice versa? At what point must we be talking about free market elements in a socialist system? Those questions we will have with us always. Every generation is going to have to answer them. And I think everyone who's serious about politics and economics is going to have to ask and answer them. But what we have to step away from is ultimately a moralizing discourse that regards capitalism and socialism in terms of good and evil that um, really obfuscates the real-world questions we now have to ask and answer. As I say, what's the future of the university system and higher education? What's the future of the prison system? What's the future of ecology? What's the future of sewage treatment? Uh, what's the future of prison reform and prison conditions? On and on it goes. Um, the socialists, for better or for worse, have a voice, have a stake in all of those issues, even though they're not, in this strict sense, questions of by or for socialism. And to move forward, we're going to need to have, really, a competitive marketplace of ideas where somebody other than the socialists has to step forward and start providing, you know, thought-provoking thought answers to uh, the important political questions of our time. Da -da 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 -da. Stalin, he killed 20 million people. Uh... You have uh, Chairman Mao, or whatever his name is, Mao Zedong. Well, first of all, in a communist state, people don't like the government because they're forcing them to work for no pay as slaves. And if I was a slave, I would not want the government forcing me to be a slave. So i like to overthrow something. So then they have to uh, cut down on liberty so people don't have the freedom to overthrow them. You're being forced to work for no pay, and you're just waiting in bread lines, starving to death. 
not too good. So we have, it's just a terrible system overall. So I would rank it on my scale of 1 to 5. I would give it 1 Gulag Camp out of 5. That's just my opinion though. Like it if you agree with me. Dislike it if you don't agree with me. Subscribe if you like what I do. Comment uh, if you uh, uh, if you own if you own the means of production. See you at a later point in time. Goodbye.